Um, so I'd just like to uh, welcome our next speaker, Dr. Charles Hicks. Um, Charles is the Senior Global Medical Director for Viv Healthcare. After spending more than 30 years in academic HIV medicine at Duke University Medical Center and at the University of California, San Diego, he, um, he, he's, during his career he served as a teacher, a mentor, a clinician, and a clinical research scientist. He served as director at the Owen Clinic at USCD, the university's HIV medicine clinic, before joining VIV Healthcare in November 2017. His work at VIV and GSK is intended to make good use of his decades of clinical experience caring for people living with HIV and doing high impact clinical research to improve management strategies in the clinic. So I'd like you all to welcome Charles, who's flown out at short notice to be present at this symposium. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's never a hardship to come to Thailand. It's one of my favorite places in the world. And so I'm honored to be back and be able to present at this 22nd uh, symposium on HIV medicine. And I very much appreciate the opportunity to do this. As was noted, I'm a full-time employee of Vive Healthcare. So the things I'm going to discuss, you need to keep in mind that um, I work for Vive. But I've tried very hard to make sure that the, the commentary that I provide is based on strong clinical and scientific evidence. And I'll try and develop that as we um, go through the talk. Now, I really like this slide. This slide shows the evolution over time of available antiretroviral therapy. And you can see, I was, uh, I was an intern, a brand new medical resident, and you can tell I'm old, but now I'm gonna give it away, in 1980, and I was working in a, the San Francisco General Hospital emergency room and saw patients we had never seen before, young gay men with diseases that we had never seen other than to read about them in the textbook. And of course, this was the very beginning of our recognition of a new disease, initially known as AIDS, later HIV infection. And you'll appreciate that from 1981, when the first cases were described, to 1987, when the first drug, Zidovudine, AZT, was approved, there was no treatment for people living with HIV. And even in the first decade after the recognition of this new disease, the tools available for doctors caring for patients living with HIV were very inadequate. In those first 10 years, we had only AZT and DDI. And it really wasn't until the mid-90s when the first studies reporting combining the nucleosides with HIV protease inhibitors showed that it was possible to control viral replication that we begin to uh, start the process of making this a chronic disease. And fortunately, the tools that became available to us in the succeeding 25 years have changed the way we approach therapy in a very favorable way for patients. And I'm going to try and suggest to you today during the course of my presentation that this evolution in therapy has not finished. And we're going to continue to consider new strategies to the benefit of patient care. Now, it's uh, useful as we look at what drugs were available to then identify what treatment strategies were employed based on the drugs we had. In the beginning, we only had single agent therapy or then two nucleoside combinations, which invariably were only successful for a short period, after which time 
patient CD4 counts again began to decline and clinical illness ensued. But when we developed the HIV protease inhibitors and showed that combining drugs, sometimes requiring as many as 20 tablets per day, we were able to control HIV replication and produce significantly better clinical outcomes. And so our treatment strategy was then termed hit hard, hit early, hit early, hit hard. Start treatment early after diagnosis and use maximal therapy to try and achieve virologic suppression. However, after a few years, we became aware that some of the treatments had significant toxicity, lipodystrophy, diabetes, increased risk of cardiovascular disease, liver toxicity. And so the strategy changed saying, because we know that over time, we are putting patients at risk of significant health affecting toxicity, we should wait until the therapy is absolutely necessary. CD4 count less than 200. And so all the guidelines included recommendations about when to start antiretroviral therapy. But then we learned that not being on treatment, allowing the virus to continue to replicate, to cause immune activation and inflammation, also had very serious health effects. Moreover, we began to develop improved therapies, including the introduction of HIV integrase inhibitors in 2007 when raltegravir was improved. And so now we're back to treating early, test and treat, starting therapy immediately, because we believe we have the tools, the drugs we need for this to be a successful long-term strategy. But we don't yet know what happens in the next block. And so part of what I want to discuss is what might we learn as we get more experience about our current therapies and how might that change our approach to therapy. There is no doubt that the improved therapies also translated into significant clinical improvements. This graph shows the proportion of patients with undetectable viral load depending on the year of the study and the more recent trials clearly are providing higher proportions of viral suppression than we had 10 years earlier. And the addition of integrase inhibitors, particularly the so-called second generation integrase inhibitors, dolutegravir, bictegravir, have pushed those suppression levels into the 90s. To me, this is quite remarkable. After more than 30 years doing clinical research, I believe 92, 93% is about as good as you'll ever do in a real clinical trial. Most of the people that are not successful are not successful because they've dropped out of the study or they've moved someplace else or they don't want to participate any longer. So I think the drugs we have, in terms of efficacy, are truly outstanding. And because I work for Vive, and because I think much of the better outcomes we observe are based on the new generation of integrase inhibitors, I want to briefly review some of the data on dolutegravir or DTG. This is a drug that has had extensive research completed and very large numbers of clinical trials reported. Randomized controlled trials involving more than 2,000 patients in treatment naive, treatment experienced, and heavily treatment experienced patients have been reported. In addition, cohort studies representing more than a million 
patient years of follow-up have demonstrated not only does dolutegravir have success in clinical trials, but also in real-world clinical experience, as I'm sure many of you would uh, agree. The drug is approved in more than 100 countries. It has been studied in children as, well, as young as one year old and increasingly in the aging population that we care for. And what we have observed in all these clinical trials, these are the trials in treatment-naive patients, initial therapy, the proportion with suppressed viral load on dolutegravir are the blue bars, and the gray bars are the comparator arm. In patients with viral load less than 100,000 or greater than 100,000. And it includes the two most recent trials comparing dolutegravir to bictegravir. And if you look at the blue bars, you will notice that in every instance, both in lower viral load and in higher viral load, the proportion of people that are suppressed is highest in the dolutegravir arm in every instance. Sometimes there's no statistically significant difference, but in every instance, the dolutegravir arm has the highest proportion of people suppressed. Moreover, if we look at the small fraction of patients who have virologic failure, termed confirmed virologic withdrawal, we observe no cases of resistance to integrase inhibitors. The single case is in a patient who was randomized to raltegravir. So unparalleled efficacy, no treatment failure with integrase resistance, and excellent tolerability. Again, the blue bars represent the dolutegravir arm, and the red bars represent the comparator arm in those same six trials of treatment-naive patients. Some people say that clinical trials are not the same as real-world evidence. Clinical trials have special participants and don't really reflect the range of patients that we actually care for in the clinic. So here are adverse event profiles from cohort studies representing uh, thousands of, of patients and showing in the first bar the proportion with treatment discontinuation related to dolutegravir, and in each section, the proportion with discontinuations related to other HIV integrase inhibitors. And this shows that dolutegravir's tolerability matches up quite well with that of any other HIV integrase inhibitor. Recently at the World AIDS Conference uh, held last summer, data was presented about a new potential toxicity. And I want to take this moment to ask you to think back to that slide that showed hit early, hit hard, wait, there may be toxicity, less toxicity, it's dangerous not to treat, let's start now, let's do test and treat, and now start to think what the next phase might be, might be. So Andrew Hill, uh, a, a wonderful clinician scientist from the United Kingdom, did an excellent presentation on weight gain and weight loss. Those of you, and I don't see too many, who are uh, in an age range somewhat similar to mine, remember how our major weight issue was people being very low body weight. We had strategies to help people with wasting syndrome. Now, in 2020, we are flipped completely to the opposite side of the spectrum, and increasingly we are concerned with weight gain. Andrew Hill looked at what's known to be drivers of increased weight and observed that patients initiating antiretroviral therapy, 
tended to have higher weight gain. Persons treated with the newer integrase inhibitors, dolutegravir and bictegravir, tended to have greater weight gain. Persons on protease inhibitors, although less striking than what was seen with the new integrase inhibitors, also had greater weight gain. And in general, weight gain was higher in women and persons of African descent than in those not in those categories. And in contrast, one factor fairly consistently noted with lower levels of great grain was the use of TDF. Dr. Hill presented the results from two studies done in Africa, which I will briefly review for you here. The first study was called NAMSAL. It was conducted in Cameroon, and it randomized treatment-naive patients to get dolutegravir plus TDF3TC or efavirenz plus TDF3TC. The outcomes in terms of treatment success were excellent, but one of the observations of concern was the weight gain observed during the course of the first 48 weeks of the study. And you note here that both arms were associated with weight gain, but the weight gain was greater with the integrase inhibitor than with the favorins. So part one, integrase inhibitor more than NNRTI. Part two, might there be another contributing factor that could amplify the weight gain? And so we look at the advanced study, another trial of treatment naive patients, this one in South Africa, with the same two treatment arms, TDF, FTC, DTG, or TDF, FTC, efavirenz, but with a third arm and added in which tenofovir alafenamide, or TAF, is substituted for TDF. Again, the treatment outcomes were e e excellent, better in the integrase inhibitor arms than in the efavirenz arms, but the amount of weight gain at both week 48 and 96 was considerably higher in the dolutegravir arm than in the efavirenz arm. But importantly, that appeared to be particularly true in the arm of patients who were on TAF rather than TDF. So here in men, at 48 weeks, the red line is weight gain in the population on TAF, FTC, dolutegravir, the blue is uh, TDF, FTC, dolutegravir, and you can see the separation suggesting that TAF may be an important contributor to greater weight gain. And this finding was even more pronounced in the women in the trial. In fact, at the end of 96 weeks, the mean or average weight gain in the women on the trial was 10 kilograms, 10 kilograms. And you'll note that the slope of the line has not flattened. It continues to go up, suggesting the possibility that not only are the second generation integrase inhibitors associated with greater weight gain, but that that issue may be amplified when we add TAF instead of TDF. And here are other trials appearing to show that persons on TAF generally had greater amounts of weight gain than those who were on TDF-containing regimens. So to our original chart of drivers of weight gain and weight loss, perhaps we can add TAF as a cause of increased weight gain. This hypothesis is under significant review, and additional data will be presented at the Conference on Retroviruses and Opportunistic Infections in March in Boston. All right, now, with that background, I want to examine our current strategies for treatment and suggest the possibility that we may be on the threshold 
of a new approach. Why did three drug therapy become the standard of care? Well, clearly from the trials I reported previously, we noted that single drug therapy, one drug, reduced viral load by less than a log, increased CD4 cells by about 50, but the effect was transient as resistance was uh, achieved by the virus. Two drug therapy produced greater increases in CD4 cells, a more dramatic fall in HIV and RNA, but AZT3TC, AZT-DDI, TDF-FTC alone, two nucleosides, almost invariably led to resistance, declines in CD4s, and uh, increases in HIV replication. It wasn't until we added three drugs and made that our standard combination that CD4 increases were sustained and viral load suppression was considered a possibility for the long term. And so in this trial presented in 1997, 23 years ago in the New England Journal of Medicine, we compared indinavir, one of the early HIV protease inhibitors, zidovudine and lamivudine. One arm was indinavir alone, one arm was lamivudine and zidovudine, and the third arm was all three drugs. And clearly, whether using less than 500 copies, and again, most of you are too young, but we started out wanting to get a viral load below 1,000. In this study, we wanted to get a viral load below 500. We had an experimental arm that was trying to get a viral load less than 50. And the observation clearly was that three drugs were better, and three became a magical number. All of the guidelines stressed the importance of three drugs. When someone is failing therapy, the guidelines say you should switch them to a regimen with at least two, but preferably three new drugs. And so in some sense, this became the law. Here are the tablets handed down by Moses. You must use three drugs. And for the last 25 years, we have not challenged this strategy. Why might we reconsider this? Because clearly three drug therapy has produced dramatic improvements in outcomes in people living with HIV. And in fact, it is this very improvement in outcome that maybe causes us to reconsider the strategy. We now know when we were starting antiretroviral therapy, we observed a dramatic difference between how long people without HIV lived compared to those with HIV. In 2011, nine years ago, that gap had narrowed dramatically. So now in our clinic, we see patients who are 50, 60, 70 at UCSD in California. We have about a dozen patients who are well into their 80s and living with HIV infection. And so we need to change our strategy, perhaps, from what will work right now to how do we plan for people to be successful on treatment, not for one year or two years, maybe not for 10 or 20 or even 30 years, maybe for longer. Because unless we have a cure, which I do not believe is in the near future, but unless we have a cure, the prevailing strategy is long-term antiretroviral therapy. Patients are living longer in the US, only uh, a fraction of patients in, different than Thailand are diagnosed at a young age. And the life expectancy is such that patients may need to be on antiretroviral therapy for decades. This year in 
uh, U.S. HIV population, the average age, the median age is 50. At our clinic at UCSD, about 55% were age 50 or greater. So what does that mean? In Thailand, where patients may be diagnosed when they're 20, 21, 22, and we think they're going to live to be 60, 65, or 70, well, if they're on a boosted PI regimen, they're taking four different medicines with each dose, they'll take 1,460 doses of medicine in a year. If they're on a three-drug combination, dolutegravir, TDF, FTC, they'll take 1,095. But if we can show success with a two-drug regimen, that number is down to 730. And if you take those numbers and expand them out to almost four decades, then the difference may be very significant. 57,000 doses of medicine versus 28,500. So maybe, maybe the long-term cumulative exposure to antiretroviral drugs could be an important phenomenon for us to address. Indeed, if we look at the drugs we have today, for which we know there are potential significant toxicities, it's very instructive to compare the date the drug was approved, the important toxicity that we now recognize, the date when that toxicity was identified clearly to be present, and how long that took. In some cases, 10 years or more. So the regimens we have now, which have been used for the last two or three years, and which we feel comfortable are quite safe. And I agree, to date, they look quite safe. Perhaps, in the long term, we may identify issues that we wish we had addressed earlier. You only have to look at a, a, a person with lipodystrophy, with lipoatrophy, which we cannot change, and wish we hadn't used D4T. Could that be true in the future? We don't know. But we do know that our population is getting older. And as people age, they develop other health conditions. They have risk factors for disease, cigarette smoking, bad diet, lack of exercise. We know that those, are, those risk factors are amplified by the functions that the HIV virus causes, including chronic inflammation and immunoactivation. And so I think we need to respond quickly to the presence of HIV, but we also need to think about antiretroviral therapy in the long term. And that then raises the issue, given the drugs we had today, remember, I showed you that two-drug therapy in the 1990s did not work, but that was two nucleosides. Is it possible in 2020 that the drugs we have available for us are sufficiently potent and well-tolerated that we could achieve long-term success with only two drugs? Indeed, people with HIV need as much antiretroviral therapy as is needed, but as little as possible to achieve the goals. We want to reduce the long-term cumulative exposure to antiretroviral therapy if that can be done safely. And we believe that the availability of current therapies, including dolutegravir, make that opportunity one that is at hand so we look at what we might, what drugs might we combine? Which two have characteristics that lead us to believe this could be highly effective? A small single tablet is the standard of care. Tolerability needs to be excellent. The ability to not engender resistance when people don't take the medications exactly as prescribed. 
targeting multiple steps in the life, fire, uh, life cycle of the virus, minimizing drug interactions, and certainly a favorable cost profile. So let me now briefly review some of what we already know about two drug combinations. Here are, uh, is a diagram illustrating two drug combinations that have been tried in treatment naive patients. First, involving protease inhibitors. In green are trials that appeared to have successful outcome. So integrase, uh, protease inhibitors plus lamivudine. Protease inhibitors plus NNRTIs, more equivocal results, and Maraviroc plus PI, less successful. What about integrase inhibitors? Integrase inhibitors plus a protease inhibitor seemed like a really good idea. Two very potent drugs, raltegravir, darunavir, results have not been uniformly successful. And finally, most recently, instead of protease inhibitors and lamivudine, perhaps an integrase inhibitor and lamivudine may also be successful. We can actually go back even farther. We can look at an ACTG study called 5142, where one of the treatment arms was efavirenz and lopinavir. And although it was virologically successful, the number of resistance failures was significantly higher in that population and led to abandonment of this strategy at the time. However, Jose Gatel, an investigator from Barcelona, now works for Viv in uh, the same job situation as I, did the Andes trial and showed that darunavir plus 3TC could produce suppression rates that were comparable to a three-drug regimen of darunavir plus TDF3TC. The SWORD studies done by Viv, a switch trial, took people who were fully suppressed and randomized them to DTG plus rilpivirine, comparing that to continuing a successful therapy and found that at 40, 48 weeks, 95% of patients on two drug therapy, 95% of those who remained on three drugs therapy were still suppressed. And no resistance to integrase inhibitors. Leading to the most recent trial, the Gemini studies. And at Vive, our, our push, our goal, our strategy for the next generation of treatment recommendations and long-term management approaches is based, at least in part, on the results of the Gemini study. The Gemini study took treatment-naive patients with viral loads up to 500,000 and randomized them to standard three-drug therapy, TDF, FTC and dolutegravir, and compared it to the two-drug com combination of DTG and 3TC. This is the population that was enrolled, over 700 patients in the two randomized arms. Most of them were, uh, the average age was in the early 30s. The, viral load greater than 100,000 was about one in five. Unfortunately, only about 15% were women because much of the study was done in countries where most of the infections are in men who have sex with men. Here are the virologic outcomes. Here at 48 weeks, the blue line is two drug therapy, DTG, 3TC. The orange line is three drug therapy. First at 48 weeks, one year, and then at 96 weeks, two years. This is the proportion with viral load less than 50. I would defy anyone to show a point on the curve where having three drugs is better than two. 
where can you identify an advantage of TDF added to DTG and 3TC? I think nowhere. Moreover, as we have seen with other integrase inhibitor studies, aside from raltegravir, treatment, resist, treatment emergent resistance to integrase inhibitors was not observed. Even when it was a two-drug regimen, no resistance to integrase inhibitors has been identified. And perhaps not surprisingly, the rate of drug-related adverse events was lower with just two drugs than with three drugs, as you might expect, although discontinuation rates for those adverse events did not differ. So now we have, I think, relatively compelling two-year data that starting a two-drug combination can produce virologic suppression rates that are comparable to that seen with three-drug combinations. Has this influenced HIV treatment guidelines? Now, before I joined Vive, I was on the DHHS panel who published the guidelines for therapy recommendation in the United States. And I can tell you from personal experience, the committee takes its job very seriously and requires convincing evidence of a relatively long term before they're willing to change the guidelines to introduce a new treatment. So let's look then at the four main guidelines that are generally cited, the DHHS panel, of which I was a member, the IAS USA, the European AIDS Clinical Society, and the World Health Organization. In all instances, HIV integrase inhibitors have risen to the top and are the preferred initial therapy. In some instances, other combinations are also included, but in all guidelines, HIV integrase inhibitors represent the preferred approach to therapy. This month, in the US, the DHHS panel revised the guidelines to include for the first time in the preferred treatment regimen, recommended first line, two drug therapy with DTG and 3TC. In persons with viral load less than 500,000 where genotype resistance testing is available. And if you look, I mentioned that the rigorousness of the clinical trials evidence needs to be substantial. If you look at the trials that have been done comparing various regimens to then the standard of care, you'll appreciate that DTG plus 3TC, the Gemini study, reported 96-week data, and the outcome, 86% suppressed at two years, was very comparable to all the other combinations reported for periods of two years or more. So DTG, 3TC, now in the recommended for most persons list of treatments for HIV infection on the DHHS guidelines. This somewhat confusing slide shows the European uh, AIDS Society guidelines and also shown in green has added DTG and 3TC to the list of preferred regimens. The preferred regimens are represented in green. This is IAS USA, DHHS, and EACS. The IAS USA guidelines are only revised after the IAS meeting, which this summer will occur in San Francisco and Oakland. And while we don't yet know, my, my supposition is that this blank section will turn green for the IAS guidelines as well. Now, the World Health Organization is a critically important group of guidelines. And they take into account not only efficacy and resistance, but also access and cost. And so 
the recommended preferred first-line therapy per the WHO guidelines is TLD. And I think the reasons for that are well known to the audience and are quite unassailable. You will, of course, be aware that the use of dolutegravir in women of childbearing potential must be tempered by concerns for a slightly increased risk of neural tube defects in women who take dolutegravir when they conceive, who are already on dolutegravir at the time of conception. And based on those data, plus strong advocacy by uh, women's groups, particularly in Africa, it is recommended that women can be offered DTG during their childbearing years, but they need to consider in a discussion the importance of effective contraception and or accepting the potential increased risk of neural tube defects. The importance being this is a woman-centered decision. Women can't be told you may not get this medicine, you can only get this medicine. They have to be engaged in the decision making. So let me summarize my presentation here by talking for a few minutes about what I think the take home messages are. If you're an HIV doctor, you can reflect on how things are continuously changing in an attempt to provide the best possible treatment for our patients. Often in a talk, I'll finish with a slide that says uh, an address from a professor to a graduating class of medical students. And the professor said, half of what we have taught you is wrong. And we don't know which half. Because new developments in the future may show us that hit early, hit hard was not a good strategy for the time, or deferring until the CD4 count is less than 200 was potentially harmful for patients. So all of you here today and those not here as well, take the responsibility for being a student of medicine always and learning what the best strategies are for our patients. No one would argue with the statement that newer treatment regimens have greatly improved and that the health and longevity of people living with HIV is incomparably better than those who were infected 35 or 40 years ago. But in the absence of a cure, I believe our mindset must take into account the potential concerns with chronic medication dosing over years and decades. And in addition, our long-term strategies must acknowledge that as our population ages, additional complications and concerns and the need for other medications will likely emerge. Early data, but I believe quite convincing data, seem to demonstrate that with currently available drugs, two-drug antiretroviral therapy, should strongly be considered as a successful approach to long-term management. And additional studies continue to be needed for us to define the best ways to ensure our patients live the longest, most productive, happiest lives they possibly can. Now I'm told that at the end of a drug company presentation, the safety message for the primary drug of the presentation has to be included. So here are some important safety data about dolutegravir. Hypersensitivity reactions have been reported, although they are infrequent. It cannot be used with two antiarrhythmic drugs, dofetilide and pilsikinide. And in those patients who have demonstrated hypersensitivity problems, Caution should be used in adding medications that might interact unfavorably with dolutegravir. And we know, for example, 
that metformin concentrations may be increased by dolutegravir and careful monitoring of blood glucose needs to be done in patients initiating dolutegravir. We've discussed the issues of pregnancy and finally women of childbearing potential who are prescribed dolutegravir should be offered effective contraception while they're taking the drug. So again, I thank you very much for the opportunity to give this presentation. I'm not trying to sell dolutegravir, but I want you to think, are we doing the best we can do? And are we providing our patients the most thoughtful, the most efficacious, the safest strategy moving forward? So thank you so much. I really have enjoyed being here.